Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. O Heavenly King, O Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, who are everywhere present and filling all things, Treasury of all blessings and Giver of life, come dwell within us and cleanse us from every stain and save our souls, O gracious Lord, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, welcome uh, once again to all of those whom I see and the many more whom I do not. Uh, my, my objective will be for these uh, last two uh, sessions of the webinar would be to present some reflections this evening about uh, the liturgy of time, uh, specifically the liturgy of the sanctification of time, and then next Tuesday, some reflections about the liturgy of the Eucharist, uh, because the liturgy of the Eucharist is the, the heart of the liturgical expression of the sanctification of life. So if you would, if you would think in those terms, sanctification of time, sanctification of life. Now, in one sense, of course, there is time involved both in what we have come to call in recent times the, the liturgy of the hours. Uh, in, in earlier times, it would simply have been called the divine office or the daily cycle of services, to speak of it very, very simply. Uh, on the one hand, which is the church's expression of marking the passing of chronological time with prayer in a way that was inherited from the Lord and the apostles who themselves uh, inherited it. We can speak of the Lord in his humanity, inheriting it from the prayer of Israel. So that means that every day at morning and evening, as well as at three-hour inter intervals, which by the time of the first century A.D., uh, the age of the Gospels and, and the, the apostolic faith, uh, the third, sixth, and ninth hours, or uh, as they came to be known in the West, which is the language most familiar to, I think, most people uh, taking part in the webinar, terse, sext, and known, which simply mean three, six, nine. The equivalent in, in modern timekeeping would be round nine in the morning. Literally, of course, it means halfway between, uh, halfway between sunrise and noon, then noon, and halfway between noon and sunset, so roughly nine, noon, and three. We have all of those hours of prayer mentioned in the New Testament. But as I was saying, in addition to the sanctification of time through the liturgy of the hours and the uh, and the fullness of the divine office, we also have the sanctification of life and the sanctification of life in the church's liturgical tradition is mostly what we speak of as the sacraments. But the sacraments cannot be extracted or, or isolated from their liturgical setting. And I'll say a little bit more about that probably both, both evenings, because I think that one of the dangers, one of, one of the reasons why uh, there is a temptation to a kind of um, superficial, superficial understanding of things, and again, by understanding, I don't mean having pieces of information only, but I mean in the experience, the realization of these things. Uh, there's a certain superficiality 
that uh, reduces the sacraments to something that we need. And so we go when uh, it's possible and convenient for us to go to get these sacraments in a kind of individualized way. It's a kind of spiritual uh, gas station or supermarket. That's what the church ends up being, that, that hands out the sacraments. Um, rather, of, of course, the sacraments themselves exist in that intersection of time and eternity, which is very well imaged by the cross, the horizontal bar, that of chronological time that we can measure in intervals, and the vertical bar in terms of heaven and earth, God and man, uh, this world and the kingdom to come, the first creation and the new creation. We can use all, any and all of those pairs to describe it. And in every case, when we speak of the sacraments, now, I, of course, I know as I think all of you do, especially those who maybe uh, are a little older and, and had traditional catechesis, you know, we were taught that the sacrament is an outward sign instituted by Christ to give grace, to convey grace. And that comes principally from the theology of St. Thomas Aquinas, and it's all very true. Uh, however, it is not all that needs to be said about the matter, because if we leave it there, we remove this sacramental act from its setting, from its setting at that intersection of time and eternity, as a doorway from time to eternity, as that which manifests the kingdom of God. And so I wish to speak, therefore, this evening and next of the relationship between the liturgy of the sanctification of time in the liturgy of the hours, the divine office, and in the sacraments, and, and I will only have time to speak, and even then it will have to be very briefly, to speak of the celebration of the Eucharist. Perhaps the best place to begin this evening, because we're at, uh, we're in the beginning of one of those very distinct seasons of the church year. Uh, everyone uh, in an apostolic church has entered into the, as we call it in English, the Lenten season, coming from the old word for spring. But in the older liturgical languages, uh, whether whether Greek or, or Syriac or Latin, simply referred to as, as the 40 days, the tesserokosti in, in Greek, or the, or the quadri, quadragesima in Latin, the season of the 40 days. And what is, what is very interesting about this, why, why we should never take it for granted, uh, and I, I, I think I inserted during the question uh, uh, period before the talk, two weeks ago, uh, a, a brief comment that I'll amplify a little bit now. Uh, many people, ma many people within the church I'm speaking of, uh, speak and act and think uh, as if this season were the most intense and, and principle of the church's liturgical seasons, when uh, that's simply not the case. It's simply not the case. For well into the third century, that means through the apostolic age, the sub-apostolic age, through the first several generations of the church, through all of the time of, of all of not only the apostles, but all of those great bishops and martyrs of the early church, Ignatius of Antioch and Polycarp and Clement, and then in the next generation, Irenaeus and so many of the others, they never had anything called Lent in any language. The church had not reached the development of that yet. They never had anything uh, that, that we would, uh, it's uh, almost unimaginable for us that there wouldn't be Holy Week, but they didn't have that either. The church had one season, special season set apart, and that was the season that in the early church was called the Pentecost. 
It didn't mean just Pentecost Sunday, like, like we often say now, the 50th day from, from Pascha, from Easter, as the English uh, expresses, the day of the resurrection. But rather, the Pentecostal season referred to that whole 50 days. And it was a season characterized by great rejoicing. Even perhaps one of the most, uh, you, there's a, you know, there's a great old Scottish sounding word that describes a certain temperament. We would say dour, but the Scots would say dour, a dour temperament. And if there's any one of the early fathers of the church, he would be in the third century that had a dour temperament. It would be Tertullian in North Africa. And Tertullian was so dour that he unfortunately died outside the communion of the church because he thought the church had become too lax in reconciling penitents and in abandoning the strict old usages. So he, he got himself hooked up with a, uh, a kind of cult that claimed to be uh, more, more Catholic than the Catholic church. And that wasn't enough for him after a while. He left that and got and and drew a smaller group of, of people around himself that were called the Tertullianists. <laughs> and unfortunately, Tertullian, a great, a great mind, uh, and and most of his writings are completely orthodox, except for the later ones when he's affected by this kind of separatism. He died outside the Catholic Church. Now, the story of the followers of Tertullian has a happy ending because St. Augustine was able to reconcile the Tertullians with the church, uh, you know, several generations later. But I mentioned Tertullian because he is, he is not known for, be, for, for his cheerfulness, let us say. And uh, Tertullian, when writing to someone who is about to be baptized, though he says a, a kind of unexpected thing, he said, oh, well, you may have experienced some some gladness and happiness in in whatever you celebrated in your family or with the pagans, but none of it comes near to the joy of Christians during the Pentecost. So that season of joy, joy in the resurrection, joy in the glorification of the Lord, joy in his ascension, and joy in the coming of the Holy Spirit to effect the new and eternal creation to perfect and transform God's first creation into the ultimate creation that is destined for the fullness of the kingdom of God. <clears throat> so that's the first liturgical season that, and it is from apostolic times, and it was characterized by uh, such outward expressions as not kneeling for any of the prayers. There was no kneeling from from Easter to Pentecost. By the way, of course, that's still kept in the Eastern churches, but maybe you of the West don't realize that it actually was the tradition of the West, too. I have, I have an old a Latin a book of hours, and it still has the rubric uh, at the end of Holy Saturday. It says in, in nice, you know, a highlighted letters, no kneeling during Paschal time. So the, at least in the ink, uh, the tradition remained, even though it was never abolished in the West, just kind of forgotten. Kneeling, which in the early church was seen as an expression of penitence, Father Hezekiah mentioned this last week, uh, became in the Middle Ages in the West also the expression for adoration. So people did not associate kneeling strictly as a penitential posture. That's why it became more common in the West, especially for adoration of the Eucharist, receiving Holy Communion, and so forth. It's a new, a new development, and it's it's not it, from my viewpoint as an Easterner, not not one to be. I I have no wish to criticize it, but but it is different from from went on, what went on earlier. So no fasting, no kneeling. And this atmosphere of joy, I sometimes have mentioned that uh, really when, when I've been giving talks on church history, as I've done uh, on and off uh, over the past years, that the church, one of the things that characterizes the history of the church is we don't really have a golden age in the church. We never say that, oh, at such and such a time, that's where it was really the best to be a Christian. 
In fact, if you have a tendency to think, oh, if I could only have lived in the time before the crucifixion and resurrection of our Lord, if I had been there with the apostles and with Jesus visible in the flesh, how wonderful it would be. Well, read in the Gospels and you'll see that it wasn't always such a great time, even for the apostles who did not understand. Jesus is continually taking them to task about not understanding, about being self-centered, about being concerned with, it, with their own place. And, and what do we find, of course, even on the night when our Lord immolates himself? I'll, I'll, I use that expression because it is from the Fathers of the Church, and I'll say more about it next week. Uh, when our Lord immolates himself at the supper before his passion in the institution of the Eucharist, how have, how have the apostles prepared themselves for that ultimate mystery of Christ's love? Well, the Gospels tell us they're quarreling about who's the greatest. That's their preparation for their first Holy Communion. So if you want to find the great time to be in the church, I think that the only little piece of time that may, may fill that place is those 50 days from our Lord's resurrection until the descent of the Holy Spirit on, on the last and final day of the Pentecost. When the church is basking, the infant church is basking, hasn't even come out of the womb yet, is being formed in the womb, and just as a baby being formed in the womb is being enriched with the, the blood of the mother and all of that nourishment. So the infant church is being enriched by the comings of the risen Lord. It says in, in the Acts of the Apostles that he initiated them into the mysteries of the kingdom of God during those days. And it doesn't go on much to say what that really uh, consisted of, but it's a time that is unparalleled. And ever since then, ever since those 50 days, the church always wishes to enter into those days. That is why the Paschal joy and its season is the first and greatest season of the church. And so, and so we might tend to say, well, Lent will take us to Easter. And there's an obvious sense that in calendrical time it will. Uh, that the cross will bring us to the resurrection. Well, there is an essentially true uh, spiritual uh, principle in that. But it's not the last thing to be said, and it may not even be the first thing to be said. For our Lord Jesus Christ, he went to the Father through the cross and through the tomb, and in the resurrection, together with the working of the Father and the Holy Spirit, and by his own power, he says, he rises. So chronologically and in every other way, the cross is the entryway of the Lord Jesus into the eternal reality of the resurrection. And the reason why that we have to say eternal reality of the resurrection is that it's something new. The person of the Son of God is not new. The person of the Son of God is from all eternity. But in his humanity, the Lord takes that humanity that he has associated himself with uh, forever. He's not throwing it away. I, if we were to imagine just by something we invented in our minds, a divine figure that came from eternity and came to this world and took upon uh, himself, our humanity, once that figure was going to leave the world, we would expect him to throw it away, throw it away as, a, as an old rag that he may have associated himself with somehow during, during his time, time here. But that's exactly not what the Lord does. He takes that humanity, which is not an old rag, it is good and so good that it is in the image and likeness of God, and transforms it in a union, an indivisible union, with his divine person. And so in that glorified humanity 
is the hope and destiny of, of us and of all the world. So that's how it is for our Lord. However, how was it for his apostles? They did not participate in the cross during the time of our Lord's suffering the cross. John was present there, but none of the others. They had fled. And Peter had come back a little bit, and that even got him into, worse, into a worse position to be there at the trial through his denials. They are hidden away in the upper room. They could not face the crucifixion. As, a, as the group of the Lord's followers, they have collapsed. So the risen Lord comes to them and breathes new life into them. He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. As the Father has sent me, so I also send you. I am the sent one of the Father, and you are now my sent ones. So only by that being recreated, newly created by the risen Lord Jesus and the Holy Spirit, are they able to go out and proclaim the gospel of the crucified, buried, and risen Lord Jesus and the reality of the kingdom of God. And they're also able to suffer and die for that, and they, each, they all do to a man. John doesn't, because John, here I'm engaging in a bit of speculation, John and Our Lady and the others at the cross are not martyrs, because their martyrdom is to share by their presence at the cross in the Lord's passion in a way that the others do not. The others share in it later. So you see the parallel, uh, a reverse parallel. For our Lord, cross to resurrection, but for the apostles, resurrection to cross. It is the reality of the resurrection that makes it possible for them to bear witness to Jesus Christ crucified and risen. They're, they have to replace Judas after, after the ascension and St. Peter says that the criteria to elect a replacement for Judas has got to be somebody that's been with us since the days of John the Baptist and have see, has seen the risen Lord. They pick Matthias. Notice that St. Peter doesn't say it's got to be one who's, who's witnessed the crucifixion of the Lord because that would disqualify all the apostles except John. So the apostles are not witnesses of the crucifixion. Likewise, and this, what does that have to do with with uh, the sacred seasons, the sanctification of time. Well, the first season of the church is the Paschal season, because only if one has the share in the Paschal rebirth is it possible for one, not just the apostles, but for us too, is it possible for one to then go forth and struggle to be faithful to that gift of new life, to the end, to cooperate with the grace of God so that the divine image and likeness is restored in us. And that requires the cross. It requires asceticism. St. Augustine in the West had two nice Latin phrases for the two dimensions of the church's life. He said the church lives in time and in eternity, uh, in eternity because those who are in Christ already share his triumph and reign with him at the right hand of the Father, but they also struggle on earth, and the Lord himself bears witness to that when uh, he says, after he's knocked down Saul of Tarsus, and says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? So he doesn't say, why do you persecute my people? Why do you persecute me? Because the victorious Lord is present in his struggling people, and his struggling people are present in the victorious Lord. Now, in, so St. Augustine says that the church is passing through time is both in statu via, in statu in the condition of the road, via, in the, in, on the road, and in statu patriae, in the condition of the fatherland, on the road and at home, both, both, uh, both at the same time. In anticipation, in fulfillment. In, in fasting, in feasting. 
in ascetical struggle, in the glory of the celebration of the transformation of the human person through union and communion with the divine nature. Two dimensions, but the beginning, the first, is that you can't struggle until you have received the gift of the new birth in the kingdom of God. So for the Christian, the resurrection comes before the cross, even though for the Lord, the cross comes before the resurrection. And that's why in the church year, it was immediately obvious for the early Christians to celebrate the Paschal Pentecostal season of joy. It took a while for them to add to that the penitential, anticipatory, ascetical, on the road, struggling season of Lent. Do you, do you follow how, how the steps of how I, I present this to you? Because it, it's not just an interesting uh, historical uh, consideration, but rather it's the revelation of what's, what's so central to the Christian life that we will. Uh, find it very difficult to reach uh, where we are going if we have it primarily uh, in our heads and our hearts that, oh, if I struggle long enough, oh, if I am adequately penitential, oh, if I finally fill up the measure of suffering that is allotted to me, and then finally, I have some kind of hope of the promise of, of glory and rest, certainly not in this life, because that's only for the very few. And probably for me, there's the longest sentence of purgatory imaginable. And then after that, the, the hope of, of the glory of the kingdom. Now, I'm engaging in a little bit of dramatic caricature, of course. However, uh, I would suggest to you, now I am no, I am no infallible uh, standard of anything, <laughs> but uh, I, I would suggest to you that we will, in following the ways of the saints who have been known for their joy, and in fact, it is a, it is a required uh, criterion for canonization that the one to be canonized has manifested the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord. Mother, Saint Mother Teresa of Calcutta lived through decades of what seemed internally to her as being abandoned by God. Talk about, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yet, did that eclipse in her the joy of the Lord? It did not. Because the joy of the Lord is first. Where there is the joy of the Lord, there can be the struggle through everything else, through every tempta temptation, through every tribulation. So that's why uh, Paschal time, the Paschal Pentecostal season, comes in first place and the Lent in second place. When everything is in their proper place, then the whole works work. <laughs> now, that's, that's by way of introduction. So we have these, these seasons. I would like to um, impress upon you this evening that it is of critical importance. Uh, again, putting this in the context of our, our webinar, which is toward a liturgical catechesis, meaning that we express our faith liturgically. And given the, the warning that it's become increasingly difficult for us to do that, because we are so twisted and turned by what goes on around us, which is increasingly individualized uh, narcissistic relativism, and therefore, our experience of being with and in each other, much less with and in the Holy Trinity, uh, 
it's as real as it always is on the one hand because God gives it to us. It is the great gift of God. But uh, sometimes our experience of it in, in the times and the, and the circumstances in which we live is, is greatly lessened. We have so little experience of this corporate expression of the seasons and feasts of the church, which are meant to be doorways into the glorious life of this kingdom. The, the passage from time to eternity, from anticipation to fulfillment, from fasting to feasting. Uh, I fear that even for many uh, very, very uh, devout uh, Catholic Orthodox Christians, that that uh, you, I would, I would just say, uh, vivacious experience of the seasons and feasts and fasts of the church that so characterized early Christianity uh, has been replaced by a sort of uh, gray, dull continuum where there isn't all that much difference. I mean, there might be some difference, but as far as as trying to find a real difference in terms of uh, time and the sanctification of it between July 29th and Easter Sunday. Well, for many people, a day is a day is a day. Uh, feast day, maybe uh, I go to church, maybe a little more or, or spend a little time with, with family or friends. But in terms of it actually being a revelation of the joy of the kingdom of God, I think that less and less, uh, for, for some time now, uh, people ha have been starved for this. And it's not that it's not there, because it, the, very, the very life of the church is built upon it, but it often goes ignored. So I want to uh, uh, develop this point with a couple quotations. And the first one I'll turn to is a... A uh, very honored name in liturgical studies is Benedictine Abbot. Of he is he is a contemporary of Romano Guardini, so first half of the uh, 20th century. And he lived later into the 20th century as well. And his name is Odo Castle, Dom Odo Castle. And he was the abbot of the the great monastery of Maria Lach in Germany. And a number of his talks on the church year, in fact, are available in this little book, The Mystery of Christ Made Present. The Mystery of Christ Made Present. Present. My edition comes from St. Bede's publications. And in his introductory chapter on the meaning of the Christian year, uh, he, has, he, he quotes from the Gospel of John, first of all, the dialogue between our Lord and Nicodemus in the third chapter of the Gospel of John. And you remember Nicodemus who came by night. Nicodemus was a Pharisee, uh, a very uh, one who was not only a Pharisee, but a high ranking one in the social order of first century Israel. And he came uh, to speak with Jesus by night. And they have this dialogue, and Jesus tells him about the birth from above. Sometimes in English Bibles it gets translated being born again, but in the Greek says to be born anothen, to be born from above. But then Jesus goes on to say, uh, Nicodemus, after Nicodemus says, how can this be? Jesus says to him, if you do not believe me when I speak about things in this world, how will you believe me when I speak about heavenly things? So even though Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus about the birth from above, that's only the beginning, says the Lord, to speak of truly heavenly things. And then Jesus says this, no one has gone up to heaven. In fact, I don't like this translation that's quoted, so I'll just do by heart a more accurate one. No one has ascended to heaven except for him who has descended from heaven. The Son of Man who is in heaven. You have to have all of those parts. And 
notice that Jesus says that the only one who can pass from, no, I'm paraphrasing, pass from time to eternity is the one who has passed from eternity to time, has descended from heaven. And Jesus says, that person is I, the son of man, who am in heaven. Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, even as I speak to you, I am in heaven. I didn't leave who I am to be here. Now, uh, and he will say similar things to, to uh, the Jews in the Gospel of John in, in later chapters. Uh, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not from this world. Jesus says to Pilate on Good Friday morning, if it's correctly translated into English, my kingdom is not from this world. Our English translations often translate the, the ek as of, but it really should be from. My kingdom is not from this world any more than I am from this world. My life is in the Father eternally, in that eternal present, the Son of Man who is in heaven. So the heavenly things that Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus of is this entrance from time into eternity, which is only accomplished in him. Well, Dom Castle goes on to say, for God, therefore, many things are possible that appear to be humanly impossible. It is no, of no value to be born again of the flesh. And Nicodemus says to Jesus, am I to crawl inside my mother's womb and come out again? Is that what you mean by being born again? Jesus says to him, what is flesh is flesh. So it's of no value to have a second birth in the flesh. But for what was born through the flesh to be reborn of the spirit is an act of God. In this case, something is being repeated, namely birth, but on a higher plane. Development follows a circle, but not a circle. And then Dom Castle uses the image of the snake that's always eating its own tail, the, the eternally recurring repetition of things. Not that kind of circle, but rather a circle that moves in a line that spirals higher and higher, winding itself up like a screw. So the spirals on a screw, picture that. It is not absolutely the same thing that recurs, nor is it something totally new that emerges. It is the eternal and divine that becomes realized in cyclical coils, which rise up towards an immovable center, bearing within themselves some touch of the divine as a symbol or as the way toward that changelessness into which they flow, like the screw. What a, what a very, very nice, uh, simple, earthly image. Like the screw, the point of which remains above, always in the same place, while the thread spirals upwards, ever and again returning on itself, each circle rising higher than the rest. That's the church year, spirals on that screw into the eternal life of the kingdom of God, ever higher and higher headed toward the apex, going around and around on, on the one hand, so there is some repetition, but also being elevated from time to eternity. Now, for that to become a reality, it takes more simply than a, a mechanical approach to worship can provide. By mechanical, I mean a kind of uh, rote reception of the sacraments or seeing the liturgy as something that manufactures the sacraments for me uh, in as many, av available in as many places and as, at, at as many times as possible. Rather, this ascending the spirals of the screw requires a transformation within us of how we experience time. Remember in the first talk, those of you who were here, I quoted from Abraham Joshua Heschel. 
And again, I'll, repeat, I'll probably repeat the quote in each one of the talks. If all we do is use time as a fuel to be burnt up, I'm paraphrasing it here, as a fuel to be burnt up in order that we may make our claim over that thing that we call my life, our space. Burn up the time to, to uh, assert your control over, over space, however small a piece of space it may be. If that's all we use time for, and if we try to squash, if, if, we're, if we're believers, if we're Christians, if we try to squash worship into that frenzy of burning time, to claim space, worship always loses. For my second quote this evening, I, I will turn to a name that I had never heard until Father Peter Galadza of the Sheptitsky Institute introduced me to it. Uh, and this is a Lutheran writer by the name of Marva Don, who wrote a book about liturgy and worship called, wonderful title, a royal waste of time. A royal waste of time. And this is what she says in her introduction. To worship the Lord is in the world's eyes a waste of time. It is indeed a royal, she has it in italics, a royal waste of time, but a waste nonetheless. Why is it a waste? It is a waste in the world's viewpoint because by engaging in it, we don't accomplish anything useful in our society's terms. Society generally recognizes only one thing. It's the principle of utility or the utilitarianism. That's time is something to be burned up as a fuel to, to assert our control. Marva Don goes on to say, worship ought not to be construed in a utilitarian way. And I would invite you to consider the image from the Gospel of John, John 12, the beginning of the Passion on Palm Sunday, beginning of Passion Week, when Mary Magdalene comes with her alabaster vessel with the precious spikenard that we're told is worth 300 denarii. A working man, uh, a man who either worked in the fields or at, at labor and building was, was paid a denarius a day generous, generally during that time. So a working man's wages for a whole year that that alabaster flask was worth. And we're told that Mary approached Jesus knowing she, she knew in the spirit, what was coming for him, because he says so. She, he says, she's prepared me for my burial. And what does she do with it? She breaks the alabaster. She doesn't open it carefully. She breaks the alabaster, and she pours it all out on him. She does not go, drop, 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 must be sparing. This is worth a lot. She dumps it all out. And everybody, even the apostles, were, were, we are told, are shocked. And they say, oh, too much, too much. Who wants her around anyway doing all this? I mean, I'm, I'm adding to the, it says, to what purpose is this waste? They, the gospel says, they, that's what they say. This could have been sold for its purchase price and the money given to the poor. Principle of utility. And Jesus says, let her alone. She has done a beautiful thing. A beautiful thing that does appear to be a waste. Worship ought not to be construed in a utilitarian way. Its purpose, now listen to this, this is wonderful. The purpose of worship is not to gain members, or not to gain numbers, excuse me, nor for our churches to be seen as successful. Uh, that, that rings home in a particular way. It, it goes right to my heart because, you know, I've, I've been the pastor here in Ukiah for, this is the 20th year, of a very small group of people who have, and it's, I don't mean to say that we're especially holy or anything like that, but we have dedicated ourselves to a worship-centered life 
but our numbers have decreased through movings away and living in a remote area that we're not able to go on much longer. So we are not, even in the eyes of, of uh, the churchly world, successful. The little St. Peter admission in Ukiah is not going to continue into a second generation. It's a one generational phenomenon. So the purpose of worship is not for our churches to be seen as successful. Rather, the entire reason for our worship is that God deserves it. God deserves it. God does not need it. He doesn't need it any more than he needs us. God does not need anything. God does not operate by need. He did not create us. And again, that this creation, this not only the human being at its apex, but everything in his creation and all its, how manifold are your works, O Lord, in wisdom you have made them all, the psalm says. This lavish creation, why, why does it exist? Why is there something instead of nothing, the old uh, philosopher Democritus asked. It's not because God was lonely and bored and needs, needs something to do. It's an overflowing, an overflowing of his love. And it is responded to on our behalf by that overflowing, which is worship, which God does not need but deserves. Worship is not even useful for earning points with God, for what we do in worship won't change one bit how he sees us. We will always still be helpless sinners caught in our endless inability to be what we should be or make ourselves better, and God will always still be merciful, compassionate, and gracious, abounding in love and ready to forgive us as we come to him. Worship is a royal waste of time, but indeed it is royal, for it immerses us in the regal splendor of the king of the universe. The church's worship provides opportunities for us to enjoy God's presence together, corporately, not as individuals coming simply for a sacramental recharge, corporately, that takes us out of time and into the eternal purposes of God's kingdom. As a result, we shall be changed, but not because of anything we do. God on whom we are centered and to whom we submit will transform us by his revelation of himself. That is why, uh, my friends, that if there is to be a rebirth of liturgical hearing of the faith, liturgical catechesis. It has to be rooted in this kind of worship that is willing to spend time on more as a fuel to be burned so that we can have more control over things. So we need to learn the art of the royal waste of time and the lavishness of the church year with its seasons, its feasts and its fast, its fasts is a banquet. It's an experience of those dimensions of anticipation and fulfillment, or as St. Augustine would say, in statu vie, in statu patrie. And it is necessary. There will be no deepening of the church's Eucharistic experience unless that Eucharistic experience is built on the foundation of a willingness to worship as a means that uses time as a vehicle of sanctification and a door into eternity. So that's my word for tonight. And uh, could, could, could have said a lot more, but it's at least an attempt. Thank you. Thank you, Father David. Uh, not only an attempt, but very insightful and challenging. I, I, uh, I'm looking forward to actually going back and listening to, uh, listening to this talk a second time because it was full of, uh, of, of beautiful insights into the spiritual life and into worship. So, so thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Father, you ready for a couple questions? Sure. Oh, well, look at this question coming in from, uh, from Deacon Joseph. He says, how would you respond to people who see their faith simply as keeping of an obligation? Or how about this, how, people that approach the faith as, why do I go to church on Sunday? Because I, the church says I, I'm, I have to. 
Okay. How would you respond? Or what would you say to somebody? Well, I wouldn't, I, I, I wouldn't uh, talk down uh, to, to uh, doing one's duty. Uh, I'm a firm believer in doing one's duty. And it's, it's a good place to start. So I would try to build on that, try to find a way to build on that. I wouldn't, I would not, uh, I don't think I would uh, uh, try to advise the person to just discard that notion of duty. I think a lot of the trouble we're in is, is from that kind of discarding. The, the, the good thing about doing, doing one's duty is that it gets one outside the prison of one's feelings. That I do this because it's the right thing to do, even if I don't feel like it. So uh, obligations, uh, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to the language of obligation in the church. Now, of course, it doesn't matter whether I am or am not. The church developed the language of obligation early on. It's not some sort of late thing. Even in the fourth century, you know, the church said that if you miss three, three weeks of, of Sunday liturgy, you can't come to communion for six months until you repent of, of, of showing contempt to the Lord's body. So uh, there is, there is the, the dimension of obligation, and it ought not to be lost, but it needs to be raised and and you know it's a it's a foundation that can hold a much more uh glorious building you know one one uh image i've used in the past father if i could add you mind if i just add one little i don't little mind at all with this um thing. it the the image of a freeway uh and some of you have heard me say this before so you can just you know tune me out if you want the the, the image of the freeway the freeway has guardrails along the side of it now, if you, if, you, if you go over that guardrail, right, you're going to die. You're going to crash your car, total your car, and you're going to die. But, you see, but, but have you ever driven down the freeway going like this? Oh, I hope I don't hit the guardrail. I hope I don't hit the guardrail. No, because you don't drive your, free, your car down the freeway next to the guardrail. You don't go slamming up against it all the time. This is, the, this is my image of somebody that's like running into mass, like, did I make it in time for – I don't even, to be honest with you, I don't know what the current rules are about when you have to make it. I haven't thought in those terms in too long. And I hope you haven't thought in those terms either. So, so the person living on that edge is, you know, is there. But we want to be driving our car down the center of the freeway. The guardrails are good. As Father, Father David said, it's a good thing. But we got to build on that. And we got to start moving toward the center of the freeway in the, in the heart of Christ and in, 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 the, in the road of the saints. And the, all of a sudden, the guardrails... You know, I mean, if you're driving the speed limit, you're not worried about it. You're driving 4,000 miles an hour. Well, you're going to, yeah, you're worried about it. Anyways, leave you with that image, whether it's helpful or not. Um, uh, Father, Susan is writing in and says, could you explain more the difference between individualism in the liturgy and personalization in the liturgy? Individualism always has either some or 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 beyond that it is exclusively exclusively expresses itself by reducing everything to the self to me or or perhaps uh it expresses itself in in piety an individualized piety is either somewhat or mostly or in an extreme case altogether consumed with this idea of a private relationship between myself alone and Jesus alone. Uh, something that, in fact, the reason why it's dangerous is that it's delusional. It do, such a thing doesn't exist. Jesus doesn't come alone, and neither do I, however much I imagine I do. So the, the invitation of God in, in creating us and then saving us even when we had fallen, though even in our fall we remain good, always not, that must never be forgotten, uh, is that he calls us to this communion within, not only, not only, but first, last, and always, within the fullness of the, of the divinity of the, of the tripersonal God, and there is, there is an eternal, I, I hesitate to use the word reason, 
but for lack of a better word at the moment, there is the eternal reason, St. Gregory Theologian speaks of this, why, why God is triune, he says. He's, God is not two, God is not four, God is, God is, of course, one, but one in threeness. And, and three is the number, not two, four, or 18. Because he says that there is necessarily, if it were two-ness, two-ness, there is a kind of exclusivity to a relationship that is, that is strictly two. We can see this even on the created level. Some of that exclusivity may be good. There's, of course, there's an exclusivity in the, in the marital union. And there's also an exclusivity among close friends. But especially among friends, if it's to be healthy, there also has to be an openness. In God, the threeness provides that eternal openness that can admit uh, creatures to be partakers of that life. So just as, as we have that possibility, potential, what we are created for, destiny, so also on, on the level of, of created beings, we have that same invitation to live with and in each other. And therefore, it's, it is not healthy, spiritually, for a Catholic to have as his or her primary expression, for example, to the Holy Eucharist, is now I'm going to receive my Jesus. Now, the, I'm not saying that that's false. There is some truth in it. But it's a, it's a derived truth, a secondary truth a truth that comes from a fullness that now I, as one of this communion of, of redeemed human beings, am receiving the gift that the Holy Trinity provides me, which, which makes me, incorporates me into the fullness of life for which God made me. That's why, uh, you know, my private Eucharistic Jesus is no different from the, the evangelical saying, my, me and my Bible. So we must be careful of this hyper-individualism because not only among believers, especially among unbelievers, it's the motivating force now of people's behavior. There's no room. People are increasingly unable. Don't we all see it? And maybe we suffer from it some ourselves. People are increasingly unable even to communicate except sending little bits of messages. Yeah. It seems to me that one of the reasons, I mean, I joke about it all the time. One, one of the reasons why I have cer a, a certain deeply rooted suspicion of, of certain expressions of the media revolution is that for all its claims to have tried to, to make communication easier, my experience of it is that it's harder and harder and harder to get access to people and communicate with them. So it's in some ways a lie. I think. Yeah, yeah. You, you may, I'm not, I, this is not an infallible statement. I'm not a magisterium. But uh, <laughs> that's uh, just some reflections on that. Father, related, related to this point, we're going to go a little deeper now, and maybe we can bring it to a close with this, comes from uh, Sister Michelle, um, who says that in the Latin Rite breviary, the second reading of Thursday in the, set, in the 32nd week, it says that the church is not a new creation, but has existed from the beginning. I would want to read the entire context of the passage, but it would, it would seem to me that in speaking of the church that way, it is, it's similar to what, for example, St. John of the Cross would say you know, in, his, in his poetry, uh, St. John of the Cross has a wonderful poem. It's, a, it's of course, it's a, a creation of his imagination, but I would like to think inspired, uh, of a dialogue between the Father and the Son even before creation takes place. And, and the Father says to the Son, I, I am making you a bride, my son, because it's time for you to have one. Of course, that's speaking of God in temporal terms, but it's, it's, not, a, it's not a dogmatic treatise. It's a, it's a poetic uh, reflection. And, and, so the, and so the father goes on to tell the son that, that the son is everything to him and he's not, 
creating the creation because of anything being lacking, but as an expression of his love. And so that there is this unique bond between the son, the bridegroom and the creation, his bride. And it will cost the son the price of, of his life in the incarnation. He will have to take upon himself the, the nature of a, of, a, of a creature and offer himself in, in sacrifice. And the son uh, says that he is, he is uh, that it will be his joy to do this as an expression of his love for the father and the father's gift. And then the persons of the Trinity say together, let there be light and creation begins. So in that sense, that communion that we uh, in the that does exist it's that to say that that the church is not a new creation insofar as it's not coming out of nothing it's not coming out of nothing it's a transformation of what of what has been since god created it or any more like we would say in the words of the book of revelation that that the lamb of god is slain from the foundation of the world yeah, it's not enough to say the Lamb of God was slain on on uh, March 25th, A.D. 30, which is where both most ancient and modern sources think it took place, but rather from the foundation of the world. Mm. Thank you, Father. I really appreciate your insights. And just to 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 um, maybe draw that to a close, and and I'd ask you to consider what Father's what the Father's talking about regarding the liturgy and its corporate nature. Uh, especially in light of this question here regarding the church. And I think it's St. Saint, Saint Porfirios, I can't remember which, which one it is. It says, says the, the Holy Trinity constitutes the eternal church. Oh, that beautiful, loving communion, which is your point, right, Father? And then we're, we are made in his image and likeness. We are made in the image and likeness in, in, this, in this communion of persons. And that's a very beautiful a beautiful concept that I think can stretch our understanding of the liturgy about our place in the church, um, about what we're doing when we come, when we gather together as a community, how important uh, this community life is that we have together as Christians. And that we, uh, there's, I always come back to this, this, this thing that, that Jesus says, and no greater love hath any man than to give his life for his friend. And, and of course God is love. And therefore this is this from all eternity, this, this sharing of, of life in the life of the Holy Trinity that then becomes uh, the, the truth of our life and what we are called to do in the liturgy. Anyway, so I, I, Father, again, thank you so much for these beautiful insights. I'm happy, to, happy to do it. Uh, um, may God bless you all and, uh, and keep you, I ask you, especially for your prayers for, uh, for the work of the Institute and for no, one, one another as we hold each other up in the body of Christ. May God bless you. And keep you. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.